What's up, everybody? What's going on? Thank you so much for being here. My name is Lee Kan Oluwoye. I am the founder and CEO of BPTN, Black Professionals in Tech Network. It is always a pleasure to bring incredible content to you live and direct. If you don't know who we are, BPTN is the largest network of black tech in Canada and top two, top three in the US and growing rapidly. We know that power comes from content, from conversation, for being engaged, that it is not about simply about, you know, the things that you learn formally, but it is in these informal spaces that opportunity happens that we take the next level. So I want to thank you so much for being here. I want to thank you so much for engaging. We are so excited to bring this incredible opportunity to you today to hear from incredible leaders and black women in black tech, to hear about the amazing things that they're doing right? But also to ensure that we illuminate and we talk about the opportunities that we have in front of us today. We know that there is a unique, we are in a unique time, a unique moment that a colleague of mine call it an awakening. Awakening to your brilliance. Awakening to your melanin. Awaken into this opportunity, not just to continue to hire the people you know the best, but hire the best people. And I believe foundationally that we are at the cusp of opportunity. That in order for tech to take the next level, in order for tech to move the needle, in order for tech to move the, the globe in the right direction, because tech is the future, it has to be diverse not because it is the right thing to do, but simply because it is a business imperative. That is the opportunity that we have in front of us here today. That is the conversation that we must have. But if we have this conversation about blackness, but don't understand that our queens play an important role in that, we missed an opportunity. We know that black women hold a special place in what it is that we understand as blackness. And we know that there's a special place that you, that the things that you take on that we must acknowledge, but not just acknowledge, but create the environment for you to thrive. So today we're gonna have a conversation y'all. And please, if you've never been at a BPTN event before, you need to know how to play BPTN well. So first of all, you're going to enjoy the conversations because we're going to bring it to you real and honest and open. But also, you cannot simply just enjoy and be selfish. There's people outside in the ecosystem that could not get in, that did not have the time, that they're going to be watching on their Twitter feeds, their LinkedIn feeds, their Instagram, all of those things. It is important for you to engage to build, to connect in. So we ask you, holler at us, tag us, hashtag BPTN. This is an opportunity to have a nuanced conversation, right? So across the social channels, I wanna make sure you're doing BPTN right. BPTN, you don't get to be passive. You don't get to you know, cook dinner or talk on lunch, or you don't get to do that when you're at BPTN. You, are focused for the next 90 minutes to, to, to two hours because we're gonna give you good content, but you're also gonna feed it back. So let's connect, let's build, let's make sure that we are staying connected here. So we have some housekeeping rules. The first thing is, if you've never engaged at a BPTN event before, you probably think I'm gonna to get to sit back, maybe cook, cook lunch or dinner or have a conversation and do another meeting while you're here. That's just not how we do it. So we're gonna ask you to lean into the chat. In the chat is where those conversations happen. I do not believe that chat simply, the conversation is one way, the conversation is both ways. So you engage us, we engage you. So let's try this out. In your chat function below, right? I'm gonna ask you some questions. The first question is, tell me what city are you repping today? 
What city are you listening in to this event from, right? Let me hear. Brooklyn is in the house. It is going fast. Toronto, Atlanta, Cincinnati, Dallas. Ooh, you, you all are focused today. Washington, the six. Long Beach is in the house. Atlanta is holding it down. BK in the house. There you go. Trinidad and Tobago. I see you. Was that St. Clair? Indianapolis. Awesome. Awesome. So let, now the next question is, what nug, what, how do you want to feel leaving this session today? One word. How do you want to feel leaving this session today? Empowered, inspired, connected, supported, ready. There you go. Inspired, knowledgeable, engaged, energized, united. Okay. You all are amped up. I see that. Right? So I think we got it now. So remember, in, in the audience also, we have, S, we, we have folks from Salesforce, the talent acquisition people. I want y'all, the talent acquisition people, to go on chat right now, say hi to the people so they know who you are, they see you, right? They know who you are, say hi to them, right? So I see Carrie's there, awesome. So make sure Emmanuel, I see you, say hi to everyone. Right, Emmanuel, remember, it's not just panelists, but everyone, so everyone can see you directly, panelists and attendees, right? So good, good, good. Make sure you're connected into them, right? You know, Salesforce is looking for good talent and top talent, right? And we know, right, that you better on black, right? You're gonna get good talent. So make sure you holler at them, right? You just make sure you drop in your information, you know, from LinkedIn on there, connect with them directly, make sure they know who you are, Right, that's really important. Now, Q and A. If you have questions you want answered during the panel session, you need to connect to the Q and A section. Right. So there's a Q and A box right beside the chat. Make sure is in the Q and A right that you ask your questions. If you even ask, if you ask have questions now, just drop it in there. Right. But that is where the moderator will look for your for your questions. It's not going to be in the chat. So you may be asking fantastic conversations in the chat. I promise you we're not going to answer it, right? Um, because as you see, it's moving quickly and we want that engagement to continue. So make sure in the Q&A box, right, you hold it down, right, you throw your questions in there. What we'll remind you a few more times, if you see some colleagues that struggle in late, that start putting questions in the, in the, in the comment section, remind them it is in the Q&A Q &A box. So Q&A is where you ask questions. Session will be recorded, right? Um, so you know we'll we'll share it um, to the folks that that were in the that were in the room today and in attendance, right? I'm um, so excited about that, right? So you know make sure that you're you're staying connected, you're live, you're getting connected, and you are having conversations with each other. So I want to make sure if you've not heard about the Be Future Summit, you now heard ten thousand Black Tech, not on Zoom, right? but in a virtual 3D environment that we're gonna get to connect and build and grow together. Global leaders are gonna come speak on the BPTN stage, October 22nd and 23rd, right? If you don't know, now you know. Welcome to Be Future 2020, the largest virtual gathering of black tech professionals ever, presented by TD Bank. B Future is Tech Summit, Career Fair, and Networking, now all virtual. From in the lobby, you can access the auditoriums, exhibitor booths, lounge, and info desk. Just click on the room you need to be in and voila, you've arrived. On the main stage, our lineup is jam-packed with tech leaders from numerous industries, all sharing trends, teachings, and inspiration for what the future holds. Streaming to you from our TV studio in Toronto. Once you join the session, you can view the program of speakers and ask questions via the Q&A button to the left of the session video. Be sure to check out the other sessions taking place in the side stage. There will be rapid fire talks, panel discussions and Q&As. Take a virtual tour of our exhibitor hall. Our partners are excited to provide information sessions and interviews. You can engage with company representatives and other participants in real time via the chat function. You can also watch videos and exchange documents like resumes or links. 
Talk about on-the-spot opportunities. Take a break and meet new faces in the lounge. Engage with speakers, leaders, and peers in public or private conversation, with or without video. Talk to anyone in the room, from anywhere in the world, all through the chat function. And if you have questions or technical difficulties, you can connect with our customer service at the information desk in the lobby. BPTN is proud to host you at B Future 2020. We're innovating to bring you networking and professional development like never before. Get your passes now. So it's on on the 22nd and 23rd of October. We want to make sure that you were there, right? So get your passes now. It's going quickly. It's going to be an awesome opportunity to build, to engage, to connect with incredible leaders, to connect with each other, to be on, you know, like face to face. You don't just got to see my face, but you can get to see each other's face. It's going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome experience. This is our moment. I want to be very clear that when we, when, when, when BPTN was founded, it wasn't on just, you know, a game to, to connect. I realized something very, very critical that there was a network gap, that there was not a gap in skill. There was not a gap in experience. There was a gap in network. And if the gap is in a network, we got to be able to make sure that that network is connected more. This is why BPTN is here. This is the opportunity that we have in front of us. So I ask you to please lean in. Let's continue to make history. As we go from where we are right now, which is the largest network of Black Tech in Canada, top two and top three in the US, we're on a journey to a million globally. Join us. I'm excited about it, right? I'm excited about what's happening and the opportunities that we have in front of us. So I'm excited about this speaker that is about to rock the stage. So if you ain't ever heard Molly speak before, Molly brings it all the time, all the time she brings it. And I'm so excited to have her here. I'm so proud to have Molly, you know, and the leadership that she's provided, right? Both at Salesforce and really across the tech industry. We are excited to have Molly here. Molly, welcome to the BPTN stage. We've been waiting for you. How are you? Thank you so much, Lincoln, and congratulations on your conference. This is amazing. I'm loving all the momentum in the chat. Lots of, lots of stuff happening. Welcome to the stage. Go Perfect. for it. It's on you now. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share a little storytelling and then hopefully give you some words of inspiration because when the team reached out and told me this was the topic, of course, it was very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know the experiences that we as black women have. So bear with me as I get my slides up. So I wanna talk about black women in tech and securing a seat at the table. And I work at Salesforce. I'm the vice president of global equality programs. And I got this job about four years ago because like many of you, I was one of those employees going, what about diversity? What about diversity? I'd enter rooms and wanna know who's gonna look like me, who identifies with my journey, and more importantly, who's my ally. But of course, then I didn't necessarily have that language. And I knew that I was experiencing corporate America very different from other people. And so when I got this job and we started the Office of Equality, of course I wanted to educate myself, read all the books, talk to as many people, do um, coffees and lunches with chief diversity officers and really dig into this. And I wanted to understand why is there this gap and their disparity? Because I know that people that look like me are just as smart as the people that are the majority culture in tech. And I wanted to make sure to understand how we were represented. So I love this picture right here. This is Bell Labs, Oakland, California. This is 1979. And these were the original coders. It reminds you of that um, movie, Hidden Figures, right? Look at their fashion, sisters' glasses. And the original coders were actually typists. Uh, tech jobs, computing, it was women's work, right? 
So I wanted to understand, well, what happened? How did computing become more statistical, analytical? And then all of a sudden, we saw this gender disparity. And don't worry, sis, I'm definitely getting to black women. Don't worry. So there's this NPR podcast that is really amazing. And it talks about the decline of women in computing, right? And look at this graph. Women are coming out of the homes in the 50s and 60s, getting educated, going to college. Then all of a sudden, you see this drop off, this red line that says, Women aren't pursuing computer science as a degree. So this NPR podcast follows these women's journey to say, what happened? Why did all of a sudden women not pursue computer science? So I know there's a few of us in the room, but um, marketers, marketers decided, do computers go on the pink aisle next to Barbie or the blue aisle next to Ken? And so think about that. Boys are showing up to university and a prerequisite becomes you need to be pre-exposed to computer, you need to know how to code. So I think about my own childhood journey, right? My brother gets a computer for Christmas. I got a record player. I got a record player with one record. It was Lionel Richie all night long. And I don't know who buys your record player with one record. So I played all night long, all night long. You got me. So, but the point here is the prerequisite becomes, as soon as you show up to college, you need to be pre-exposed to a computer, know how to code. So let's think about the digital divide. COVID-19 is teaching us that not everybody has Wi-Fi, stable connectivity, and extra computer in the home, and essential working parents are not able to sit there and handhold their kids through a Zoom class. So think about this disparity that was created in the 80s where education failed us. It didn't say, wait a minute, how do we provide an equitable experience for not only boys and girls, but let's talk about people of color and specifically black people. So I started to get ready for this presentation and we say something at Salesforce that representation matters. I wanna see myself reflected on a stage. I wanna see myself reflected back in my leadership. Representation 100% matters. How do I know a company is safe and inclusive? It's seeing people that look like me thriving and surviving at those companies, right? And again, I'm gonna actually say surviving, not just surviving, thriving. So I look to this report. This is Lean In and McKinsey. And McKinsey is known for doing the Women in the Workplace study. But on Black Women's Equal Pay Day, just last week, they put out this study, the state of Black women in corporate America. And the headline is pretty grim. The workplace is worse for Black women. It's worse. And let's talk about and break down what this study is telling us. The study is telling us that 58 black women are promoted to every 100 white men. But catch this, black women will ask for promotions as at the same rate as men. Because you know the headlines will tell us women aren't negotiating, women aren't speaking up, women aren't doing this. Well, sis, we're trying to secure the bag. We're asking for the promotions, but what's happening there? And for every 100 men hired into manager roles, um, there's only 64 black women hired. So let's break down what this study is telling us. We're underrepresented in leadership, which you all knew. We're less likely to, to get that support, that advice, that advocate that we need. Less likely to in, um, engage with senior leaders. So how do you get that seat at the table with your senior leaders? And then let's talk about microaggressions. Can I touch your hair? Wow, you're so articulate. Oh, how do you say your name? All those things that we experience, and we like to say at Salesforce. Now, while one microaggression may not be a big deal, it's like paper cuts over time, and it's eroding your trust, your passion for that company. And then my boss, Tony Profit, he's great. He calls it onlyness, the lonely of being the only the only black woman in a room, the only woman on an engineering team, the only parent or the only not parent, right? That onlyness where you recognize and it's, it's, it's like it's like amplified when you are that only. So let's talk about shared memories. And I'll tell you a little bit about this seat at the table. So we're hearing a lot about this woman right now in news cycles, but the late great Shirley Anita Chisholm. She's my shero, not just my hero, my shero. And Shirley very famously said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you bring a folding chair. So I wanna to talk to the black women in tech about how you can get your folding chair. So when I think about this folding chair, I think over my career and I think about times that someone's provided a folding chair for me. And I also think about times where I need to provide a folding chair for everyone else. And then we as black women, I hope we're providing that for one another. 
So how do we prescriptively do that? When the study said it's about exposure to senior leaders, elevate, elevate black women. Black women are interested in becoming top executives. Studies go back to the lean in study. It's telling us that black women are ambitious and there's no such thing as too ambitious. We're motivated and we're not just motivated for greed or for money, but we need that too. We're motivated and we want to be role models and do the right thing for the company. So when you think about the type of organization you're trying to create, you really need to anchor that on what kind of employee do you want? And then going back to that, black women ask for promotions. We're asking. We need folks to step into that for us. Sponsorship. I love to talk about sponsorship over mentorship. For me, mentorship is a nice coffee. It's a nice coffee date. How you doing? Tell me about your career. But we have to get ourselves aligned to sponsors. And studies show that Black women are the least sponsored in corporate America. What does sponsorship look like? So first of all, don't just go get the biggest top executive you can have as a mentor. While that's great and that, that's cool, you need to get someone that touches your job or influences the rooms where decisions about your career will be made, right? So you want a sponsor in a room who says, oh, we have a stretch assignment? I happen to know that so-and-so wants to move into leadership or so-and-so is passionate about that. You want someone who will use their clout and have some skin in the game to help move you forward. And the second thing is, it's a career sponsor that's going to give you the tough feedback that might be holding you back. So it's not just about coffee, it's about sponsorship. And another thing I'm gonna say to you all, uh, for the first time I'm in my career, I work for a black man. I have a 20 year career in tech. I have never worked for a black man. And I promise you it is an amazing, inspiring and uplifting experience, but we're not always gonna have a boss or a mentor or sponsor that looks like us. Stop holding out for a black mentor. My theory in life is all of us needs a cisgender white male sponsor or mentor. White men are winning in corporate America, good for them. They should be teaching us how to win. So don't let barriers like that hold you back. I have a great story of a woman at Salesforce. She was in our New York office. She asked me to be her mentor and we set up a coffee date and I was happy to help her out. And we get on the phone and I said, okay, where do you wanna go with your career? What do you wanna do or how can I help you? And she said, well, I'm an executive assistant and I like to move into the business. And I said, great. I happen to know an executive assistant who moved into the business. And she said, well, is she black? And I said, it doesn't matter, sis. She's on the path that you wanna be on. So we're gonna leverage that and I'm gonna use my clout to broker a relationship. And then I want you to check back into me and see how it goes. And the other thing I say is amplify the voices of women and especially black women, excuse me for my typo, amplify the voices of black women. You have got to, you know, we call this thing he peak where a man says, a woman says something in a meeting and everyone kind of ignores it and keeps moving on. And then the man says the same thing and everyone goes, great idea, Bob, that was excellent. Well, you have to amplify the voices of those women and make sure they are heard. And then we think about equality. And I don't care if you wanna call it equality, equity, belonging, inclusion. I just want people to do it, right? Make it an equitable workforce. August 13th, 2020 in the US, was Black Women's Equal Pay Day. That means the year and months that a Black woman had to work to earn what on average a white non-Hispanic man earns. So we need companies that will commit to equal pay for equal work. And it's not about just doing an analysis by gender. You also need to go a step further and do that analysis by gender as well as race, intersectionality, making sure you're accounting for race when you do that. And then I got even more bad news. The year 2130. If this gender wage gap persists, this is how long it will take black women to recoup and make what white women, I'm sorry, white men make. Since we can't wait for 2130, it's just too far off, we can't do that. And let's talk about the role of allies, right? And I know people think allies is super controversial or we're placating to folks, but I want folks to be my ally and I wanna be an ally to someone else. At Salesforce, we're intentional about the language and we've been on this journey of allyship for three, four years now. And we say allies ask, listen, show up, speak up. Allies ask you about your journey, your career aspirations, what's going on with you. You listen, you listen with empathy and respect 
and this isn't the dining room table over Thanksgiving, so there's no argument which doesn't mean we're necessarily going to agree, but we're listening with respect and empathy. And you show up. Show up means so many things. During COVID-19, it means before you launch in a call, you just check to make sure everyone's good. Everybody good? Everyone okay? Anybody need anything? How are you showing up for people? When you see a woman get talked over or her ideas stolen, are you speaking up for her? So speak up. And speak up when there's that joke. Speak up when it's uncomfortable. And studies show that while folks think they're being our allies, we don't necessarily as women of color feel like we're always getting the allyship we want or need in a room. So I'm gonna ask you, are you bringing your folding chair? Are you doing what's needed? Sponsorship over mentorship, amplify and advocate, equal pay for equal work and find your allies. There are very well-meaning majority culture folks walking through the doors of corporate America that will do the necessary to help us move forward. So I really want to impart that on you. Lincoln, back to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with the BPTN audience. Wow, Molly, you threw down. You, you I know, it's like record speed. Oh, you threw down. There you go, Molly. Uh, thank you for being awesome. Like you see folks are giving you love before I even said anything. So thank you for being great. Thank you for holding it down. Um, it is so, so, so incredible to, to, to have you, um, to have you as a leader, right? To have you connected in, right? Just keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate you, right? Um, it is so amazing to, to just see you, you shine, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the work that you're doing in, in community and in industry. So, you know, continue doing your thing and thank you. So please give Molly, you know, a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Molly, for, for, for doing that. So something, I always like to say, you know, gems. So she said, we cannot wait to 2130. Man, y'all, that is for, we cannot wait till 2130, right? And I love Melissa. Melissa was like, I got a bill today. I can't be waiting till 2130. I got a bill right now, right? And excellence is right now. If there's nothing else you remember, remember we cannot wait till 2130. That is a gem, right? Your time, our time is now, and this opportunity is now, and there's an opportunity to ensure that tech is strong, is better, and is hiring the best talent, not just the talent that it knows the best, right? This is the opportunity. So I'm so pumped up about this panel that is about to come up, right? So Molly just laid it down. She gave you some data. She gave you some realness. She gave you some content, right? And this panel is now gonna dig and go deeper into that, right? I'm excited. I'm asking you to lean in now right, directly up into your laptop. Hopefully you've got this on big screen because these voices, these, these leaders that are about to come to the stage are about to tear it down. So I wanna introduce our moderator, right, Jamie Bosby, and she's gonna come on and she's gonna hold it down and she's gonna make sure that this panel does their thing. So Janie, welcome to the stage. Excited to have you lead this session right, and represent BPTN and this awesome, you know, group of leaders. Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, Lakon. Oh my Lord, Molly actually laid it down. I'm sitting here with all this fire and I can't wait to debrief it. The amazing speakers we have now. We have people from all over the world, all races, all genders, all backgrounds today. And I'm very excited to debrief with four amazing powerhouses, four women in tech who are leaders and crushing it. And so we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask all of you, that you have the privilege of joining me for the next 50 minutes on an amazing tea, coffee, wine, virtual chat. I'm just sitting with my girls and we are going into it. So you have the privilege of actually just leaning into that chat. If anything lands with you, finger snap, give me those emojis, like hallelujah, whatever, whatever lands with you. And if there's somebody you know on this call who's going to miss an important nugget, Type it out for the person. You hear something that you're like, oh, I gotta tweet that. Type it out for somebody else next, okay? And so without further ado, quickly introducing myself. I'm Janie, I'm Chief of Staff over here at BBTN. I'm a speaker, dancer, YouTuber, and all around energy goddess. And we're bringing the energy here tonight. 
And so without further ado, please welcome to the BPTN stage, Jumake, Jasmine, Inkechi, and Sarita. Let's do it. Okay, come on, ladies. Can I hear you? Can you say hello. hi? Hello. Hi, friends. Hello, hello, hello. hello. <laughs> so, and so let's I have told the people that you're bringing the energy tonight. We're going to go into nuggets and information. But I think it's very important to actually start with some context. Let, I know you. I'm blessed to have Kechi as my mentor, Sarita as my friend, and we've talked with Jumake and Jasmine throughout the week. But I want the people to get to know you. So let's start with your story. Please tell us, how did you get into tech? Because I know there's come side degrees here with NK and Jumake, and there's arts and commerce. But how did you really get into tech and into leadership? Share, please. Uh, I'll, I can take that one. It looks like uh, I'll, I'll jump in, jump right in. Um, first of all, let me just make sure to start from a place of gratitude. I think you know that's my big thing. And make sure that anytime I'm having these kind of conversations, super grateful to be here, super grateful to talk about this hot topic of conversation that is so important to have. But to give you some background into who I am, so I was actually born in the UK and raised in Kenya and Switzerland. Uh, proud Jamaican uh, from birth, but you know I'm uh, now a mother of two. Living here in Canada and uh, came here as an international student. Um, did hospitality and tourism at Ryerson University. Um, and I realized very quickly that hospitality was not going to be where I was going to be happy. The big thing for me was the inability to have weekends off, evenings off, etc. And so I actually fell into tech. I started off in the customer service segment uh, of a tech technology company. I realized there were account executives making two to three times more than I was. And I thought to myself, I need to be in sales in some way, shape or form because I am here on the, on the customer service side, answering the questions, doing all this. I should also be in the sales segment. So kind of fell into it. I say that with a grain of salt and that I obviously worked very hard to get into the space. Uh, but my big thing was, you know, making sure to get into the space, stay in the space, and here I am today. So that's a little bit of uh, my backstory. Thank you. And Sarita is a manager who leads business development folks over at Salesforce. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I can jump in. I feel like I'm the next uh, non-tech person on the call here, or tech in the sense of my background. So nice to meet everyone. And Jasmine, I am calling you from Chicago, uh, but I'm a California girl at heart. And so in my day job, I see after a pretty phenomenal global team at LinkedIn, um, working with some of our largest clients, really trying to help them with their hairiest problems. But outside of that, I'd say consistent, which, which will hopefully show up in this conversation, I am in it for our people. I care deeply about Black folks having opportunities, being present in these sorts of conversations. Uh, similar to what Molly shared, that power of sponsorship and mentorship, right? Like that is what I, that is what I lean into um, more than anything else. And that opportunity to develop people and to invest in our communities and create equity um, is core to my uh, personality, I'd say, and really kind of my driving purpose. And for a lot of that, it really started at home with me. I am privileged to be proud of the two parents I have. They were teenage parents from the South. They gave birth to me at 16 and 20, which is a story that should have ended in a lot of different ways. But for my folks, it ended up with a dad and small business and a mom who's a chemical engineer who moved on to be one of those 1.6% of folks that Molly mentioned in that VP and C-suite um, position. So really, it started at home for me. I saw this powerful black woman who was about her business and was also about bringing other folks along on that journey. And that has been endeared into me um, throughout. So I'm super excited to talk a bit with you all about my experience and also learn from these other uh, panelists today. Thank you, Jasmine. That's powerful. We're definitely going to dive into that. Jamaica, you want to go next? I'm sure. So first off, thank you for having me. Thank you for just putting this together and allow me to be connected with these um, other beautiful women. Uh, my story starts from just when I was young. So I'm Nigerian American, Nigerian parents uh, came here. It started for me in college. So my dad um, ended up starting the whole life story of coming here and starting over. But fast forward, um, he ended up becoming a microbiologist and my mom ended up becoming a registered nurse. So I had no interest in anything STEM related. I didn't like anything. But when I got to college, I actually wanted to work in entertainment. I saw that I was very much into the arts, but uh, my coursework showed that I was strong in science and math. Uh, so I knew medicine was out. I ended up choosing computer science and got a job uh, working in tech uh, right before I graduated. So 
I my years in tech spans uh, over a decade now, and um, I I've done everything. Like I started out as an application developer. I was a systems analyst. I was a quality assurance tester. Ultimately, to moving into uh, technical project management and consulting. So. I am the owner of Signature Red. I'm the principal, and that's a technology consulting company. Um, outside of my consulting work, I uh, produce events, experiences, and I create platforms for women in tech. Um, two of those would be the Tech Women Network. It's an online uh, community and career development platform for diverse technical women. And the Hue Tech Summit, which was the first uh, tech summit for women of color, uh, designed to educate, elevate, and empower them. I'm passionate about women, women's issues, so this is right up my alley. And again, I've been through every role in the in the tech space and, and entrepreneurship. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Wow, very colorful. And NK? My turn! <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So first of all, oh, God bless BPTN for this amazing experience. I feel absolutely blessed to be here sharing energy with y'all. And Jim, okay, I'm looking at your wall and it is lovely. I love the <laughs> wall. Um, so it's interesting, true story. Just before we started, I got this message that I have to read because I said, this is going to be my intro to my intro. Develop a strong opinion about yourself so you don't accidentally start believing what others say about you. Hallelujah. That's the first nugget I leave with y'all that want to leave here feeling empowered. Um, but that's who I am on today. I'm empowered in my skin. I'm invisible and I own it. I no longer shy away. Um, who I am here today in this experience is more important than who I was yesterday. And what I share here today counts in helping everyone, you know, move forward. That's what I want to do. And, you know, God bless my career. Where I am today, God said, you know, MKT, I just need you to put your foot in the door and hold it open and let 10,000 BPTN professional technology network people come through. I would do it as a payback for, um, for the blessings I've had. So I am um, first generation Canadian born to very proud Nigerian parents, but that's a whole different <laughs> story. So I thought I was literally raised in Nigeria here in Canada. Um, I was exposed to computers and programming at a very young age. So I had a black cabbage, a cabbage patch doll when they came available. But alongside my cabbage patch, I had a computer, um, Commodore 64 and Atari. I know I'm aging myself. On that slide, I was born in 70, then Molly showed I was born in 72. And, <laughs> and yes, I look down good today. That's right. And I love puzzles and logic. Um, my dad is an engineer, and so our house was riddled with Rubik's Cubes. Um, I don't remember if you remember the shuffle boards, but anything that really required you to think about how to take it apart and put it together. And I love, and still to today, I, I, I play a lot of those games. And I played piano, which is um, an affinity towards math. And so it was organic that I ended up getting into mathematics and computer science. And to be quite honest, um, especially now that I'm asked to speak on a lot of panels, I, I don't really remember the demographic of my class, but I do I don't really recall there being a lot of people that look like me. I mean, there was a lot of international students. So um, it's been a space that I have just occupied by the sheer fact that I love being in it my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I got my break in my career in 1998, where um, I was kind of in between um, going to do my master's after doing a bachelor of science in mathematics and computer science. And my parents pushed me out the door saying, take the job, take the job. <laughs> and I took the job. And a few weeks after taking the summer, like summer job that ended up full time, I reached out to HR and asked them if they had any technology roles that maybe I can apply for and apply my university. And they were static. So that was about 1996. So that was, you know, a, a peak time in tech. And that was really the last time I ever really had to reach out and ask and ask for a job. And ever since then, um, just through sheer, you know, experience um, doing the work, showing up every single day. I've been very mm -hmm. blessed to move from Hudson Bay Company to Fidelity Investments to Rogers to um, to IBM and now to TD, um, just through mostly referrals. And so um, that's why I say I'm really blessed, and I'd be willing to hold that door for others to come through. So you know, that's uh, that's where I am today. I'm pumped to uh, share the rest of the energy with you guys. 
I'm excited. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories because I just I'm just sitting here and thinking of the wealth of experience and all the energy and inspiration and empowerment I can feel despite the data we've just seen. But like I think we should actually lean into that data a little bit. There's 400 plus people on this call. I want us to actually be real and talk about that data we saw because that was stark, right? Um, so we have two two of you who have computer science degrees and two of you who fell into tech. But then we've seen that there's a curve and there's people leaving out. Right? What do you think is the reason a lot of black women are leaving tech? One, I don't know how much time do we have? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think for, I, and I'd love to hear from other folks. I think some of it is for me, right? You go to a place, like I'm not one of those people who's not with a computer science background. I fell into tech because I was a subject matter expert in the world I was in before, right? Like that was my, foot in the door. I had an advocate inside who brought me in and I've loved it. But it is hard work when you don't see people that look like you in a room, right? Molly talked about that onlyness of being the only one when you feel like maybe you outside of scope, right? I'm not actually a diversity and inclusion expert, but sometimes I get asked to be. That's not my job, right? That's not what you hired me to do. So I'm curious how others feel, but to me, I think it's some of what was shared before. Do you see people that look like you? I happen to have STEM right in front of me and I hear that and other stories. You all had it in your parents, right? What if I don't? What if I don't see that? And then once I get there, I'm the only one. That's tiring sometimes. That can be hard. I, yeah, I think I think there's also a move towards, you know, a lot more technologists needed. So people with really technical roles. So a lot of the supporting roles and maybe, um, especially if you're getting into tech later on in age, you might not have, you know, grown up as a programmer and, or even kept it like myself, I'm in leadership. And so even I, as I look at what's next for me, there are roles I'm looking at that are not necessarily uh, within technology. Um, but I do think that when, like, if I could say something, I think we don't have to leave tech. I think you can actually still move into roles that have some technology aspect to them. Um, because tech is everywhere and it's in everything, right? So, you know, for those that left, come back. <laughs> and for those that think you have to leave, you don't. You know, reach out to us and understand how you can actually stay and crush it. I agree. And one thing that really stands out for me as well is, yes, people are leaving, but I actually thrive on the onlyness. And it's something that only in the last couple of years I've started to thrive on Someone it. I just said that in the chat. <laughs> thrive yeah. on the onlyness. Exactly, because every time I walk into a room, when I was an individual contributor, I'd walk into a room and we talked a little bit about microaggressions, microaggressions, Molly talked about that. a bit. And for me, it was stepping into a room and being asked to go and get the coffee, you know, mm -hmm. could you get my coffee, please, you know, mm -hmm. or it was, oh, is somebody else going to be in attendance, you know, is your manager going to be here? It's like, no, 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 it's, it's, it's just me, you know. <laughs> And so for me, the big thing is now I begin to thrive on it. I begin to actually make sure that my voice is being heard because at the end of the day, uh, you know, things are not going to be changing overnight. Mm. What I want to do is okay. do something better for the next generation, for mm. my daughter, for my kids. And that is where I get the power to kind of continue on every day. Because at the end of the day, you're going to walk into the room and chances are you may be the only, chances are you will be the only black woman. So work, yeah. work it, work the room and do what you got to do because, hey, open the door for the next person coming down the path. <laughs> I love to I love to actually offer up an, a perspective on the only like mm -hmm. if you're not the only find it right. find your mm -hmm. only because you should be the only what are what is differentiating yourself from the room and if it just happens to be that you are the only black the black woman own that That's but if true. there are other black mm -hmm. people or other people that look like you in the room what's your differentiator because you oh you want you look DNA the set, DNA we all share a different DNA that makes us all uniquely ourselves so find yeah. your own find your only <laughs> and i'll just well, add uh, for a reason that people are are leaving tech because that's part of uh the work that i'm trying to do is just encourage those that have been in the space for a long time to stay um but a, a lot of people feel like they cap out and it goes back to that report that was shown earlier um they're just not enough of a pathway up uh, for people in tech. And so people at some point, you know, if you've been a team lead, project manager, or, uh, you know, uh, a manager of some sort uh, for years, and you can, you're not getting that promotion, or you're not getting that opportunity to move up, then you start thinking about an exit strategy, mm. you know, so I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the reason. It's like, we're trying to, um, in, in, encourage more people to join, but then there's 
it's like this there's a ceiling there mm -hmm. and when we're all you know at, eventually at the top like people just start think so unfortunately that um, okay i think you just went to mute oh no that uh that's that's all i had to say about why they leave so then that, that is actually real like there's a seemingly glass ceiling in, for some black women in certain areas, right? But even more than the glass ceiling that exists in the professional space, and we'll talk about professional, is there's sometimes words that come from people who love us. There's a bunch of Nigerians in this panel, some Nigerians on the call, Jamaicans as well. You know, the things your mom and dad told you about what it means to be a woman, especially a black woman, that you've just found out now to be a flat out lie. Myself, for instance, like, Jenny, you're too loud, you're too expressive, things like that that I found out is my own. So what are the things and these challenges that you've seen coming from the cultural context, but also things that the society has told you that is not true, that you found, found out in your career. And sometimes you're like, I wish I knew that 10 years ago. I wish I owned it 10 years ago. What are those things? Be seen, not heard. <laughs> uh -huh. So I got into uh, leadership um, at the age of 32. And, um, and at the time, I'm very proud to say that it was really young. It was, I, was young I, was the, I was the youngest one in the room a lot of time. And so I had a lot of, el like, what do you call them? Um, people that were older than me um, that, <laughs> that were reporting to me or that I was working with. And it was tough. I had to get out of that cultural sense where okay. you respect your elders, be seen, not heard, um, especially African, respect the title. Mm. Mm. I say respect the human um and 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 that's most important so that took me a while to really do that and i'll be honest with you like i think it's only really in the last few years that i have found my authentic voice you know yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i think one thing for me was also when it came to hair i know we're going to get to this topic that's like <laughs> topic might as well get there <laughs> sure. but you know Growing up, it was relax your hair, straighten your hair okay. as straight as possible, you know, um, and keep it back and keep it kempt and keep it together. That was the, the biggest message. But now, you know, you see more and more cornrows in the workplace, crochet, weaves, whatever. And I love to see it. And I, NK, we talked about this just before. I was like, yes, girl. Yes. Like, this is what I want to see. Express yourself in the way that you know and it doesn't matter what you look like what your hair looks like i really don't care at the end of the day it's like it's that expression portion of it that comes from within and we cannot what the best thing for us is to understand that we don't have power over what people are thinking what people are yeah. saying but our reaction yeah. Yeah. what we bring to the situation is what matters so when you walk in the room whether your hair looks a hot mess or not you own yeah. it it is what yeah. it is i don't you know <laughs> yeah and i i love that go ahead, oh, go ahead. No, Jamoka, you have to say something. <laughs> no, sure. Well, definitely about the hair, but but um, just to go back in terms of uh, like childhood and parents, one of the things that I, I realized as an as an adult is um, just that whole piece of balance and humility with mm. um, with confidence, right? Mm -hmm. And just um, you know, not drawing too much attention to yourself, you know, like immigrant parents sometimes it's like, oh, you know, I'm a very direct person. And so, and I, I opinionated also. So I, I, in some, there were times where I, I was kind of hushed in that way. Uh -huh. And I think that over time, um, it made me hush, you know? And so um, at work, um, looking back now, I can see that there were times when I didn't speak up or I wasn't as assertive as I, I could be, or um, I didn't take credit for stuff, you know, and when things or credit was being given to someone else, I didn't speak up about it. I just figured it was, it was no big deal as long as the project got done, you know, so these are things that I think um, carried into, carried into uh, the workforce. And then here, I, we're going to get into that. So, but that, that's all I have to add. <laughs> no, thank you. And on the topic of like being your authentic self, the truth is, there's people say that, and I've heard it now, that it's easier to be your authentic self and to roll into the work with your 4C hair and your red hair and cake when you're a leader. People say, yeah, okay. cause you're, like no one's gonna be like, she's, you, you obviously know your value. But there's women on this call who are starting their careers out, possibly the only ones in their areas of, of expertise and possibly also in white male dominated spaces who have an authentic voice and have possibly been punished for it at one point in their careers. And they're just starting out, they're not trying to shake, um, shake the narrative too much, but they want to they bring their authentic selves to work. 
and they want to show up in their hair and they want to speak up for injustice. Well, how do they navigate spaces like that when I, you I have to? <laughs> yeah, I'm no, ready. I just, I, you know, I just, I feel emotional because mm -hmm. I think back to my younger self and, and you are right. Like obviously where I'm showcasing, you know, red hair has happened when I was in, um, um, when I'm in a position of uh, like executive position, mm -hmm. but I didn't do it because I am one. I did it because I finally found who I am. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to any of those, any young woman um, starting your career, first thing you got to do, wake up every morning and look in the mirror and tell yourself that you matter. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to okay. envision with your eyes closed who that person is. And that's the person you need to live. And if that person has red hair, braids, side shades, you know, that's who you have to live. Because let me tell you something, what I found out when I shaved my head and showed up at work is that some people were like, something looks different about you. And I'm like, well, half my head is. <laughs> and I realized that in that instant, that's not what they saw. What they saw was my vibrant, my, my vibrance. I finally felt alive. I, you know, I have, I have alopecia and for once I wasn't trying to cover it up. You mm -hmm. know, I felt free and, and I felt like I finally rid myself. I shamed the shame of why I used to wear wigs and this, any other, and mm -hmm. I felt alive. And because of that, they didn't see my shaved head. In fact, you know, I, I, since then it's, it's been better. Like I've gone bolder with the color and I recognized that it was only because I got to that place. Didn't matter about my title. It just really, mm -hmm. truly mattered about who you are. And you have to believe it. And if you find there's anyone that can appreciate you for who you are, then you, then you have to be confident enough to say, I want to stay where I'm appreciated, not tolerated. Yeah. And I'm going to take it that next step. Stay where I'm appreciated, not tolerated. Hallelujah. Thank yeah. you, NK. <laughs> Definitely. I'm going to take that to the next level. Uh, and I'm going to challenge you on that, NK. I think that, yes, that's the one piece of the pie. But the other piece of the pie is, does that company appreciate the values that you're bringing to the table? Yep. Do you have same values as that company and if not then at that point that is the real question yeah it's right. mm -hmm. not aligned with you in terms of your values and your vision and what you're trying to achieve and accomplish then you need to start asking yourself whether you need to be at that company or not and that is you know, amen that. totally agree yes, i love that right because it's sort of like i'm not willing i want to acknowledge that like people before us had to play that game right? right like folks that came before us they had like they really did feel like the only way that I'm going to be successful is to assimilate. Like I have to do these things. So I recognize that I am sitting on the privilege of folks that did that before me. So it does not feel as hard for me to do those things. But to Sarita's point, y'all, like I'm not interested in anti-blackness in the company that I'm trying to give my best to, which is ultimately what that is sort of saying, right? And so there's a privilege in being able to say, hey, I see this game. I see how this is playing into your perception of me. And I'm not willing to participate. Mm. I'm not willing to sit here and be a part of that. I'm going to go somewhere else instead, right? Because we're all here because mm -hmm. we're smart, successful people, right? And there's this idea that there's scarcity in the market. And I don't buy into that. I don't buy into that at all. So if you're not welcomed in where you're at, you need to go find a place that will take you and welcome mm. you and celebrate you, right? Yes. Go where you're celebrated. Go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Amen. Start your own company. <laughs> Did you just say start your own company? Yeah, start, start, your, own company. start your own business. Yeah. You, you know, I actually saw data that actually said that black women are the the highest number of businesses are owned by black women. Well, now let's like there's a whole conversation about how we're also the least funded in the entrepreneurship space, and that that can open a huge door. Okay. But I want to talk. Let's focus in because I'm like this hair conversation. I've been holding it a little too much, and I just want to let it out. So you've definitely faced challenges in your career coming coming up, like microaggressions. There's been times, and Sarita, we've talked about this from with the book, the memo, where you're sitting there as a black woman, and something happens to you at work, and you're like, "Am I crazy, or did that just happen?" Can you share some examples? A lot of times we don't speak on it because we're like, "There's something in your head, most likely." Can you share some of those challenges? Because there's people who are here right now looking for, I'll say, solace or knowing that it's actually something in there that's not them. Can you share some of the challenges you faced on your climb to leadership? Definitely. And I will start with like bigging up Minda Hearts and the memo. If you have not read this book, I cannot underline it enough. When I read this book, it was exactly that, that feeling of, am I crazy? And as you read this book, you're going to sit there and you're going to realize that, no, you are not crazy. These things happen to 
too many of us, too many times and too often, unfortunately. And what I've realized now is historically when those things would happen to me, for example, oh, can I touch your hair? <laughs> um, which which is always interesting or oh my god your hair grew like overnight like okay uh you know there, <laughs> there are a whole list of items that you know i can pull up or or when they actually feel your hair then the response to like oh it, it feels kind of like wool like i've had that before you know and it's just disgusting first of all but i realized that i was also quote unquote, part of the problem, I was mm. allowing these things to happen. Mm. I was allowing the situation to take place. Or if I see it happening to a colleague, I was not saying anything and then would chat about it after. Or, you know, they would ask to touch my hair and I would say yes. And I'm like, well, why? Maybe I should ask to touch their hair. Like that was the first thing that I started mm -hmm. doing nowadays where I'll say, oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Can I touch yours first? And then it becomes this awkward thing because it's, it's a weird thing. <laughs> I don't know you. I don't want to touch your hair either. So um, that's the big thing. But I think for me, it's, the importance here is that we are vocal about mm -hmm. these situations. Do not sit back and just take it. And if you see the situation happening, make sure you say something. And typically what I do is I actually ask a question in response. That is one thing that helps, um, you know, to hopefully alleviate for them to realize that they're doing something weird, but also to calm me down, right? Because <laughs> I can get a little angry. I am that angry black woman, I guess, but hey, here we are. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had um I had a recent experience uh, well recent as um, when we were in buildings so and uh, so I had been late to a meeting and uh, because I'd been stuck in an elevator and I so when I walked into the meeting and it was a meeting with a bunch of um, I think about four executives um, including myself from TD and a vendor and so we're in the meeting I walked in and I sat beside the only other woman in the room she is a VP. And so the dialogue went on and the introductions had happened before I'd arrived in the room. So as we neared the end um, of the meeting, there was some commentary about, so now we were gonna start some, you know, workshops with, you know, sort of the SMEs and that when the, her EA can reach out and uh, they can reach out to her EA and get them booked. So shortly after the meeting, I got an email from one of the lead vendor people with the list of names of the people that needed to be booked for the meeting. Cause I figured he looked at the meeting invite and realized that I must have been the EA. And so I, in that moment, I brought the EA into the chat and I said, yo girl, this is an amazing opportunity that we're, you know, that we need your help on to book this meeting. And this lovely gentleman here is going to help you really smash that experience. And if you need support, you know, do let me know. And, I, and then obviously my signature was at the bottom. And I saw that gentleman in the hallway um, shortly after that email was sent. He was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I said, I just want to know, what did you learn about that experience? Mm -hmm. Teachable moment. Right, the old me, <laughs> before I, <laughs> now that I have self-awareness, might have said, you know, dude, we got to take that, <laughs> we're going to take that outside <laughs> after I flex. <laughs> No, but it was true. Like I had to ask him, what did you learn from that experience, man? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a story from like early on in my career. I think I shared that I started working in, in tech um, immediately, like after college. So I'm like wet behind the ears. <laughs> and I started out as an application developer. And I just remember by my second year, I was the lead developer of this of this um, application that was utilized globally, and I had, by that time I think going into like year three I was tired and I wanted to do something different. Well, I didn't realize it immediately, so I started looking for other job, other positions in the company, and uh, you know they have they had these pro this process where you had to kind of get permission from your current manager to like apply for the next job or whatever but because I was the main person that knew I was then the youngest on the team because then they brought in outside consultants but long story short um, he was blocking me he was blocking me from getting other positions and what happened was um, he got a new manager and that manager put a buffer between me and him and put a team lead um, over the development team and she was a black woman and so when i went for the next position i was able to use her she helped me get it uh, bottom line so that's one way where someone was kind of blocking me but in the end it was a sister that you know mm. looked, 
looked out. But those things happen, you know, when they, these companies, they have these processes that you have to go through um, to try to get other positions and checks and balances and things like that. But there's, there's the things that are happening behind this prevent you from doing so that you won't even, you know, you really can't speak on or go to, or really go to HR for uh, exactly. at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I feel like there's this unwritten playbook that everybody okay. else knows about. Everybody else has read this book. Hmm. Because, you know, <laughs> their cousin used to work there or their family member or so-and-so. And so they have this playbook and they all read it and they, you know, they play golf together and that's how they, how, uh, you know, and so for me, it's like now I'm trying to rewrite my, you know, future or like my path and make sure that I am aware of what this playbook is and mm. I can play the game just as well. And I think that's the key here. And the big portion of that is, you know, we talk about networking, we talk about conversations, but it's not just about networking and conversing amongst us. It's about, you know, who is your Caucasian male sponsor? Who is that Caucasian male mentor that's going to talk about you when you're not in the room and talk highly about you when you're not in the room and essentially open that door for you for you to then open the door for somebody else that is the key here and so speaking on that key because molly mentioned sponsorship and how it's more important than mentorship and mm -hmm. i i'm there too because like yeah. nk will share this earlier on and how mentorship can come across different levels yeah. um, your mentee can mentor you someone older can mentor you it, okay. it's not a typical way but sponsorship is what is very missing in our community in our community five years ago when i moved to canada i was an incredible student i was raising my hand like pick me pick me sponsor me it mm -hmm. wasn't happening and it's real there's a lot of really bright folks amazing smart people in our industry in our community who are looking for sponsorship and just don't know how to navigate that. Mm. So I'm looking for your advice on, to, on how people today can navigate finding a sponsor that can stand mm -hmm. in, in the gap for them. And sweeter to your point about the unwritten playbook, it's still kind of taboo in our community okay. for someone to see a job description and ask for coaching internally. It's something we don't, we don't do, but in other communities, they do it very boldly. So mm. how can people navigate those situations around finding sponsorship, but actually getting somebody to speak on their behalf when they know they're worth so I think, I think, so I'm going to share two different stories, right? So I think um, sponsorship is really about somebody who's in a position to put you forward when you're not in the room, essentially, right? So I have a, I have a situation where it was a, the sponsor was somebody whom at the time was probably a manager. And it was an opportunity where they were selecting from a, you know, about 300 people, a group of people that they were going to review to have an opportunity to have a, an hour with the president of TD Bank. And I had presented at this event, and I would like to say I empowered the room and left a lasting impression. And so unknowns to me on this particular glorious day, then my name was put into this. And so the outcome for me was an email one day, weeks later, um, that um, had me being the selected employee of the 300 to meet with, you know, Barrett Mizrani, who is the president of TD Bank. And it wasn't until a couple of years later where, again, I was presenting and this individual had been in the room and she had mentioned, you know, I just want to let you know there's, this, and she told me that she had been the one who had seen me that time. And so what that lesson taught me, and I share this a lot, especially with mentees, is every experience you're in, yeah. every experience you're in matters. There is a sponsor in the room. Believe that for whatever it is. Because it might just be somebody who recommends you to somebody who's in a position to put your name somewhere. So we have to stop taking experiences by experiences for granted. How you leave them matters. And that's one. And then the other one I recognize too is that you want to know that you have sponsors. But sponsorship does take building relationships a lot of times, right? So there's the sponsors that you know it could develop from a mentoring relationship. But I think we're in an amazing time right now with everybody virtually. And guess what? Kind of a little bit more available <laughs> to actually nurture relationship, mm -hmm. right? Virtually and bring your energy out and just step into that uncomfortable zone and be courageous and start to build relationships because it, ta it does take some time. And then as that relationships being nurtured and cultivated and you'd be surprised opportunities are going to come up and that individual is going to remember this, that experience that they're growing with you.
Thank you. I love that example so much, right? Of like every single opportunity matters. I found myself presenting in a meeting where there are people I do not know. They go and ping my manager afterwards and say, man, that Jasmine, she's got it together, right? So I do think there's something to say of just showing up as your best self, which I know we're already doing every step of the way. But I'd also challenge this group to be bold in making ask of sponsors. Mm -hmm. I think I have struggled in my career sometimes where I felt like I needed to beat around the bush, take my time to get to that ask. Meanwhile, I'm watching my peers boldly go up to the VP and saying, hey, I saw, I saw that you saw me do that well. Would you be willing to learn more and speak on my behalf? So that's a lesson I think I have learned and almost goes back Janie, to your question earlier of like those things that we learn as women or black women, like just be grateful, put your head down, don't make too many asks because you've already, you already got it good. You already maybe made it further than other people. I'm not with that anymore. I'm trying to be bold and intentional about what I've asked. And I think the other part that I have seen to share a quick story, when I was first going out for a manager role at LinkedIn and everything I was being told is you don't have enough experience in seat yet. Uh, you know, there are other people who have tenured careers and I said, that's fine but have I been doing an incredible job? Is, is that no longer true, right? So let's start there. And I had a sales partner, a white male, who heard through the grapevine that I was going up for this promotion. And he said, do you want me to send a note on your behalf? Mm -hmm. And the fact that he came to me with that, right? And so I think about the allies on this call, the men on this call, whomever, like that advocacy and him being so bold and saying to me, because to your point, he knew the unwritten rules. He knew that somebody was going to need to write and kind of hype me up, not just the work that I was doing. And so I have tried to be bold with other people now. When I see them mm. going for their next opportunity, hey, can I write something on your behalf? Yeah. Can I speak on your behalf? And so I think it's like a two-way street there, right? Like I would hope that the folks on this call were being those bold sponsors for mm. others. And then mm -hmm. if you feel like you don't have that person yet, to my point earlier around scarcity, keep asking, keep mm -hmm. looking around. There's someone out there that is willing and happy to advocate on your behalf. No, thank you so much, Jasmine, because I, what I just heard from that is not only should you be loud about what you want to ask boldly, but give people the tools Bring it to help you. Like, mm -hmm. give the tools to help yeah. you. From, yeah, I learned that from Bowles and you, so thank you. Like in, that. in addition to that, um, you know, one thing that I have been doing more recently and something that somebody told me to do is to write things down. You mm -hmm. forget just how many things that you're doing in your everyday life that is can be pertinent to that leadership role to that next role to wherever it is that you want to be in your career prime example uh, i started the erg group group here in the toronto office in canada bold force the black organization for leadership and development the canadian equivalent to bold force in the u.s from the headquarters and my realization was i was already running and leading a team of 12 people before i actually stepped into a management role but i didn't write it down i didn't think about it it was just my side hustle, my passion, and what was interesting for me, and the realization that I was already managing a global budget. I was already managing a team of 12 people and leading them to success. Write it down and big up yourself. Talk about yourself. Don't forget to talk about yourself. Yes, it's great when you have advocates and people who amplify your voice, but if you are not amplifying and advocating for yourself, why would somebody else want to do that for you? So remember that as well. Thank you. And so um, let's actually talk about current day today. Right now, Corona is outside, right? We're still we're in the pandemic. And with the recent out uproar of the anti-Black racism after George Floyd's mother, all of a sudden there's an uproar about Black Lives Matter. Meanwhile, for some people, it's been the truth for them for decades and hundreds of years. And so now there's this new opportunity, as I like to see, I'm an optimist for Black folks. A lot of people have put their careers on pause. A lot of people are just like saying, oh, it's a terrible time, Black Lives Matter. But I see it as an opportunity for Black people to stand up. And I think it's a great time for Black women. Hello, Kamala Harris is out there. Ozoma is getting her new job at Netflix. Um, the district school boards in Toronto, we have new female Black represent representation. So there's people who are stepping into leadership. And so what is your advice for the young women on this call who are looking to be leaders, who are pausing right now because they don't think it's the right time on how to actually shine their light and take what's theirs? How do we navigate that? Um, I think I, I'll, I'll add, and I think this uh, touched on uh, a little bit of what was shared earlier and uh, finding your authentic voice, like now's a great time for discovery, right? Like people have jobs or people are furloughed or, you know, there's just a lot of different situations going on, but, but now's the time you can really do some introspection 
and figure out what it is that you want to do, like you ultimately, and and what what is your secret sauce, right? Like it doesn't matter how many bloggers there are out there. Um, if no one blogs like you, it doesn't matter how many podcasters out there if no one has your voice, right? So it just it just now is the time to really discover who you are and what it is that you want to ultimately do so finding your your authentic voice and don't see uh, don't don't see barriers because right now the sky's the limit you know yeah. like what Janie said like there's a lot of opportunities going on with this virtual world that we're we're in people a lot of people are more touchable reachable tweetable dmable mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's just so much opportunities now that you can um, yeah. take, take advantage of. So just find out what you're unique and what you're passionate about, and map out map, map out a plan. I, yeah, I would say to add to that, you know, we have to, and I'm doing this myself. And I love Jim. Okay, that you talked about this is the season to really get to know who you are, and it's and it's mm. true. We have to stop asking for permission. Stop asking mm. for permission. Stop waiting for inclusion. I mean, like right now, seriously, go out and buy the goddamn hard back table with, that would withstand any type of windstorm, plop it down on the floor, buy a chair and sit down and build your own room, right? Like that's how bold we need to honestly be. And if it doesn't there, don't complain that it's not there, you build it, mm -hmm. you know? And we have to stop waiting, stop asking permission and definitely stop waiting for inclusion. Thank you. And so how can companies and our allies on this call, because the truth is, as a Black woman, and I know this is very true of a lot of other Black women who have raised their hands to, to seek out allyship from other people, non-Black folks, even within our own communities, Black women as well who are leaders, white women, because the truth is when we talk about women in tech specifically, I know I've been to those events, I'm like, I don't think they thought about me in this event, right? Like, so when we're thinking from an organizational standpoint, when we're asking organizations and individuals who don't identify as black to actually be true allies. What does that mean when we're asking people for that? For that? So yeah, I can jump in here. Oh, I think a part of it, just very quickly for me, I think sometimes what I've experienced in this conversation of what you asked is that there is a monolithic black experience, right? So I'm a leader and I'm trying to figure out a one size fits all for every black woman at my company. And I don't think any of us on this call is asking for that, right? What I do think in a very tactical way you can do is take each individual in your organization and the talent that they bring and have a plan for that black woman, right? And same to you here, like, what is your plan for me, manager, VP, et cetera? And then do those two things align? So I think that's my headline. Let's take it down to the individual level sometimes. Think specifically about the talent you have in seat, not just this big picture black women in tech, but your the folks in your seat right your purview and how are you supporting them in their process yeah i absolutely agree i think one thing that we that always gets confused or that always um you know people are talking about a lot right now is oh we need to hire more black women we need to hire more more black people chances are you already have at least a handful of black people in your company already why are you not amplifying their voice okay. why are you not advocating for them why are you not being that inside champion for that individual and really, you know, stepping up to the table and saying, look, hey, you know, how can I help? Like, let me, let's talk about this. What, where are you planning to go to your point? Where do you want to go? How can I help you get there? And let's have this conversation. I think that's key. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the hiring portion, that is a whole nother story. But interestingly enough, I had a great conversation today with some members on my team and they had said to me that what really put them at ease during the entire sort of like interview process, understanding process was having somebody that looked like them, at least have a conversation with them prior or even be sitting on the interview panel or whatever it may be to make that person just feel just a little bit more comfortable stepping into mm -hmm. that situation. Mm -hmm. That's a side note, but more importantly, just advocate for those that are already in your company and then start looking about expanding and, and looking to hire more. Advocate for those in your company. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other Thoughts? Jumaka, do you have anything? Um, I'm just in a different uh, space in the sponsorship. Like my sponsorship as an entrepreneur is, is different. Like I think I'm looking for people that can help me uh, make connections with people at corporations, you know, that can advocate why they should collaborate with me or participate with with an event or something I'm doing with the, with the network. So, and for me, which just, what's always worked is just authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, just not being a taker, like I'm a giver 
um, and just also extending grace. That's um, another mm. thing because I realized early on and now I could see it for myself that there are a lot of people that do want to help, but they can't always help. Mm. And okay, you know, and we just have to manage our expectations of other people and just just balance it out, right? Because even though that, that person that you're asking for mentorship or sponsorship, whatever it is at that moment, and she may not be able to give you that monthly meeting that you want or may not be able, but she might think of you for something else, you know, like that might be her way or his way of helping you. And you don't know what battles they're fighting in the boardroom, you know, to help you keep your job or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. I just tend to like extend grace to people mm -hmm. and just always be authentic with my, with my ass. So that's, that's yeah, that's me. Thank you. And I think that also, that also makes point to, to cancel culture. Cause that's big now. It's like one mistake somebody makes about not using the right word, we're quick to cancel them, forgetting to extend grace. And I think that applies in that context as well. Mm -hmm. So, and so what I did in this section was actually spend, just like group everyone's questions because we have so many into the conversations we've asked you. And I know we're coming short on time. We have three minutes. I don't know where time went, but I wanted to give each of you an, um, a quick 30 seconds to leave with like parting words, something you want some people to know about you, in case you can plug your You Matter video because that's really powerful. And let's talk, let's give for the next three minutes, let's just say something important that you want to share with people. So since the time is ticking, I will, <laughs> I will go. You know, first and foremost, I think there's power in surrounding yourself with people that will support you. And, you know, first and foremost, leaving this call, just, you know, really examine your environment. Be, be bold enough to look left and right. And if you have anything that feels disempowering, you know, I would say that that's step number one. You have to be bold enough to, to walk away and no, don't tolerate disempowering environments. Mm -hmm. um, I would say to anyone that is, you know, out there thinking that, you know, there isn't Black women talent, oh, there's a whole heap of talent. <laughs> And just the same way we can Google our vacations and search online for the best deals, I say use that inner talent to really find and source. There's a lot of black, there's no shortage of black women in, in tech and, we, and they need to be found and they need to be hired. And, um, and then bottom line, um, because Janie said it, and I know this is not the end of the thing, I just, it really matters to me that people know that they matter. I know what it was like to live in skin where I wasn't feeling empowered. And uh, so much so that I founded an organization called Empowered in My Skin. And that You Matter message that I said, I mean, there's power in those two words for it to have gone viral, 7 million views shared over 20,000 times worldwide. So don't discount those two words, wear them emblazoned on your chest and say them to yourself every single day and then put on that super cape and go out there and be empowered. Amazing. Um, I'll just add j just again, you know, you are the secret source. You have a unique disposition to do something. There's a problem out there that maybe only you can solve, like whatever it is, there's something that you were created to do. Um, so find that, find your authentic voice and go for it. You know, like I said earlier too, the sky, the sky is, the sky is the limit right now. And to those um, that are introverts, uh, because that's what I'm finding a lot with uh, the, te the technologists, um, you know, my geek girls, um, now's the time to shine. Like, take advantage of this virtual world, this Zoom, this Zoom world, write more, um, get in the chat boxes and ask for <laughs> leads. You know, this is a time where you can, you know, where you, you don't have to be upfront, but you can find ways to navigate and, and work it, though. That'll be my advice, but just remember your secret sauce. Find out what you're supposed to do and do it. And Jasmine and Sarita, maybe before you go, maybe even drop some career paths that you're seeing are going to thrive with this new digital world that you think um, Black women should be thinking about navigating too. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, sales. <laughs> <laughs> I can't underline that enough, right? I feel like it just needs a highlight. It's something that I never even knew existed, something that I didn't even realize was there. Like I said, I just kind of fell into it. Mm -hmm. And as women, as black women, you know, we have the power to, to be powerhouses in these industries, in this space, and to obviously make some good money at the same time. So if I were to say anything, I would say you have, you are a powerhouse already. You probably already are and just don't even realize it. So take that, 
and go with it. You will likely be the only woman. You will likely be the only okay. woman of color, but hey, own it, use it, and I'll and open the door for the next person because that is the key thing here is making sure that the next person coming after you doesn't go through what you went through as well. And for those that speak French, courage, you'll make it. <laughs> I love that. I feel like I, I plus a thousand to what was shared, right? Like for me, it's as simple as a lot of what we have said. If you aren't advocating for you, who will be, right? And part of me advocating for me is fully believing in my skills, the reason I'm in the room, that confidence that I've picked up from every single woman on this panel. And so I think that it starts there, right? It starts with believing that I deserve to be here. I'll do the hard work, but I believe I deserve to be here. And that's your differentiator, right? There's no one that can do what you do because no one has had your experience. No one brings your point of view. And I think that's really important. Um, and then just through this point, y'all, like get money. I sales, like sales is not something that anyone told me about. I feel like we didn't really touch on that economic aspect, but like our success and that, like our economic growth is so empowering for us our families, the people after us. So I, I just love it. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And I think talking on that really briefly was very important, um, the economics of it. I always say to women, like, do not negotiate for yourself what other people come in after you because the other woman is going to anchor her based on what you anchored. So you better make sure you collect your bag. And with that, thank you so much because we've learned about the Bragg book. We've learned that you matter. We've learned to actually navigate the system and how to network at different levels, the importance of sponsorship. I am blessed to have shared this couple minutes with you guys and everyone on the call and everyone checking in. Thank you so much for your questions. I know this was very helpful because it was for me and we will see you soon at another BPTN event. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being incredible. That was a fantastic, fantastic session. You all were amazing. Thank you again for just been so awesome, right? What an amazing session we just had. What a great conversation that just took place, right? So huge thank you to the BPTN community. Huge thank you to the team. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being awesome, right? I heard, I learned so much from this conversation, right? I learned so much from this ability just to rock this stage with you all and just see the amazing things that you all just did. Right, so thank you again, team, for being amazing, for being awesome, for staying focused, for being on task, right? Because it is about you. We know our queens need to, need to be strong. We know that as we build, we're gonna build together. We know that tech, right now, tech needs, needs you, right? So thank you again for being awesome. October 22nd, 23rd. You got to be there. Be future. Imagine two days of rocking with each other. Imagine two days of being just in the same space all the time and just connecting with each other and getting to know each other, right? And if you're an ally, you're a company that wants to lean in, make sure you're connected with BPTN. This is the place. This is how you do it, right? You make sure you're connected in and connected together. So I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you for being engaging. Please connect in with each other. We're gonna leave the line open again for the, re for the rest of the time, right? And this is the opportunity for you to get to know each other. Thank you again for being here, right? Share your LinkedIn profile, drop it in, get to know each other. This is the opportunity, right? You are awesome. Have a good rest of your day and be well.